why are local school boards so important and what qualities do you see as most and least important for school board members? Mm. Okay. That's, that's an excellent question. And most people don't understand the nature of the question. Um, we could go all the way back to 1607. Well, more specifically, 1620, the old uh, Satan or old deluder act of the pilgrims was the first mm -hmm. education law. Now, I want you to think about that, 1620. And I bring this up that as we move forward with the founding fathers, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the Northwest Passage, the um, no, I'm sorry, the Northwest Ordinance of 1785 and 1787 all had education components on that. So when we talk about why is local school boards important, it's important because from our very beginning, from 1607 all the way up, education has is extremely important, and our founding fathers understood that and realized that. But a proper education is is what's called for yeah. um, as well. Um, and so for the local school board, I think the... Uh, the, the characteristics of what you said that needs to be in the least of, of is important. One, I think you, a person that's going to be on school board, I think they need to go into this with an open mind. And when I say an open mind, it's not necessarily a, a political philosophy. What I am saying is an open mind of expect anything because you're going to see everything, you know, um, I think a candidate or a person on school board, they need to know themselves. I cannot tell you how many budget cycles I was the lone vote where it was an eight to one vote against that budget because the priorities for me were um, you are not going to put more money into the administrative side versus the classroom or you're not going to add more administrative um, more administrative positions versus classroom teachers of what we clearly needed at that time. So you need someone that knows what who they are in their value system and is willing to be the lone voice or vote um, on that as well. You need someone that's willing to take the time that will actually, you know, politicians talk about this and they do a good job with this. They say, oh, I'm here to listen and so forth. But then you never see them again until the next election cycle. You need someone that's willing to not only do those things that I just said, but also go back to the public after they're elected, like the day after, and at least say thank you. But then if you go, if you have civic leagues or community organizations that meet, you need to be there. And you yeah. need to listen and you need to ask them what is important on, say, the next budget cycle or what are your thoughts on this agenda item that's coming up? You know, um, those are important qualities. And those are a few um, that I think a person needs to have. The um, lesser qualities, if you will, would be obviously if you are beholden to groups. If you're getting the endorsement of the NEA or the local um, version of the NEA, if you are beholden to, even though many local elections are not necessarily Republican, Democrat, but we all know, <laughs> you know, when you listen to a candidate or whoever is endorsing whoever, if you're beholden more to uh, an outlook or a philosophy than you are to serving and learning, then you have no business being there. But unfortunately, that's what's happened. Um, that side has gotten their folks on and they've done quite well um, with, with it. Um, if you are a person that, do not that, that does not have the backbone to actually be willing to be a lone vote, you have no business being there. Um, you know, if... And also, too, I would say that if you are one... And you have a tendency to, how can I see, say this? If you have a tendency to know that the opposition, you know, is coming to speak and you've already made your mind up on something or you're looking at them as less than a constituent 
or less than a person and you're seeing them as an enemy and that does happen, then you have no business being on a school board. The, you know, the thing is, I don't have to agree with you 100% of the time. But at the same time, um, more importantly, I don't need to be disrespectful. Right. Um, also, too, and this is very key. This is very important. And, and I, I guess depending upon for those that are watching, I, this could be a positive or a negative. And that's this. As Christians running and becoming elected um, representatives, not officials, but representatives, um, you Christians need to understand that we don't wear hats. You know, uh, Mr. Adams, nowhere in scripture does it say that I have this hat, that I have my career hat, that I have my parent hat, that I have. I mean, Bible does talk about the responsibilities of parents and so forth, but it never talks about that we wear hats. If you're a follower of Christ, then you're a follower of Christ in all fields. Right. And so as Christians, when items come up for a vote that clearly goes against our faith, we should be voting accordingly. Because again, the Jesus follower hat, there is no such thing. And, um, and, and you know, and some may say, well, you know, civil government versus religion and some might actually agree with that statement you know it is a true statement because if you go into it saying that you're this and then you try to live another way you will become feeble-minded and uh, uh, you know on the fence and that serves no one at all yeah yeah so i think what i'm hearing you say is and you made this statement early on you have to know who you are um, and then represent yourself for who you are, your core values, your core priorities, and then let people decide whether or not they want you to represent them or not. And then you have to be diligent in uh, being faithful to that, while at the same time being a listener, being a learner, and uh, staying engaged with the whole community. Uh, because if you don't, I'm not, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I'm, now I'm not saying what you're saying. I'm just saying from my own perspective, if you don't listen, if you're not respectful to everybody, uh, it's impossible to have influence. And uh, at the end of the day, any position in politics, which school board members, uh, you know, it is, it become everything becomes politics, unfortunately. Uh, but you're an elected position or an appointed position, with, depending on the location where you are, uh, but you're there to represent others. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, having that ability to engage others and influence others is critical to getting any policy uh, past or any processes. So let me just a couple more quick questions. Uh, um, you, you're a numbers guy, and that's become evident in uh, the way you've been speaking. Um, so, and you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe just kind of give us a top two or three uh, in your experience. Uh, what do you believe are the most critical elements of a school's budget? And are there areas where significant spending takes place, but perhaps brings little real value to students? Okay. Um, and and, and let, before I attack that question, let me add on to what you just said, too. A, a perfect example of this um, was the fact that after I got on and was elected, I would go back to the different civic leagues across the city and there was one, well, there was two in particular, but the one I'm thinking of, um, I would go, and, and clearly, I, I, I knew when I walked in there, <laughs> you know, the, the political uh, ideologies of myself and, and this civic league was very different. Mm -hmm. But here's what I'm getting at in, in with what you're saying, too. Every time I'd walk in there, I was welcomed, and I had multiple people would always tell me, say, look, Mr. Lamb... I don't agree with your vote, but the fact that you always will take the time to explain your vote 
And I understand how you arrived at that. I may not have agreed with the vote, but I understand and agree with how you arrived at it. And you always keep us informed. You know, Mm -hmm. clearly that was coming from the other side. And Mm -hmm. so you have to develop that. Now, going with what you're saying on this question about the budget. um, Hmm. This is this is good. (laughs) Um, and, And this is part of this learning component, though, of what I said. So I think the highest priority of any budget needs to protect and focus uh, the classroom and or the closest thing to that classroom. And so you have to make sure, uh, do you have enough staff? Do you have enough teachers? Do you have enough teacher assistants? Do you have enough bus drivers? Are your bus drivers... Uh, I'm sorry, are your buses in working order? Um, Do you have enough material? Um, You know, copy paper is not the responsibility of the teacher. It's it's your responsibility to get it in the budget. You know, do you have the materials in order for these teachers to do what is asked of them? Um, The least, for me, my opinion, that if you're not covering learning in that classroom, then other things, and I know many would disagree with me on this, then you should not you should not be cutting, say, French classes or foreign languages before you're cutting athletics. I know that there are some that make it to school off of scholarships, and that's great, that's fine, that's not taking away from it. But if the purpose of school is education, and meaning most of us will agree education in that classroom, to become, you know, a well-rounded person as far as subjects, then versus a basketball, a football, a baseball, a bat, and so forth, then we need to prioritize that as painful as that will be. The other thing that I found that was wasteful that had a very little really impact is also things that um, we had to fund, but this is where parents, once you become aware of this, Maybe this is where the pressure starts getting put in. Say, we would have to fund things that were coming down from the federal government or the state that that really had little to no impact with regards to what's happening in that classroom. Let me give you an example. And I'm probably saying the name of the bill wrong, but anyone could probably look this up. I think it was the Neil Covent, the, the Convento bill which is a federal law that says that every school division, if you have homeless students that arrive into your division, you must take on the burden of the transportation costs to make sure that that student gets back to the division of which they came from. I thought that was preposterous because looking at our budget, we were spending a quarter of a million dollars on this. I remember my first year in the in the school board retreat, I said, why don't we just enroll them into our school division? We save a quarter of a million dollars. We get more teachers. We get more bus drivers. You know, we update some technology things that need to be dated. And I was told, no, we can't do that because that's federal law. That's a perfect example of, of, of many, many things that comes yeah. down. Um, another one. And this will probably get me in trouble. Um, Every state has their version of state tests that they have to have at the end of the year, Um, especially in reading. I want to say reading and somewhat in science and math that is based on the federal mandates that you have to test every student in reading and math and science. Okay, so what has school divisions done? So they go and we hire more reading specialists, math specialists, which really are just, I mean, in many ways, glorified numbers crunchers. They're bureaucrats. Um, They're not really helping in the classroom, actually reading, struggling readers. What do they do? They provide professional development for teachers that don't even have a minor in that area to say, well, try this, try that, and and so forth. So it adds on to the, the layers. To me, that's unnecessary um, completely uh, with that. 
so. Well, there again, I think if I may just interrupt here, there again, often uh, that whole process is just going back to our early conversation. Uh, it's a means of taking a shortcut toward getting the end result of that test score that we need so that we can continue to get the funding while it's not actually giving true guidance and instruction and helping people really know how to do math or know how to do whatever. It's about helping figure out how we can get these kids to pass these tests. Often that's really, it's the short game. Oh, oh, it is. And, 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 you know, also in the budget too, what I love is um, the, the concept of remediation, <laughs> the remediation for like summer. So instead of teaching that child that's actually on a second grade math level, but he has to pass the fourth grade math SOL test. So we focus on pouring money into tutoring so that they can pass the test versus tutoring to bring their math skills up. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, yeah. again, yeah. It, it's, it's crazy. In, in the school division that I was here, um, I'm going to go so far as to say um, one thing, but then your actions showed another thing. So we had a, a, an issue with attendance. And why was attendance being a problem? And everyone talked a good game, but nothing was getting done because that's not what we're going to... Well, then Virginia turned around and made attendance part of your accreditation. Oh, my, we have to hire <laughs> now truancy officers. We have to invest in X, Y, and Z. When it was like, okay, you're only doing it because the state said so. You're not doing it because actually good attendance helps in education. Yeah, right. It, right. It, you know, it's things like that that, that just was, was always irritating to me. Um, mm -hmm. of how the public school system will go in. And anyway, in, in case in point, I, I don't know where people listen to, you know, on podcasts and so forth from other states, but here's a perfect example. Everybody talks about rigor and critical thinking skills, okay? And school divisions mm -hmm. talk about it all the time. You know, we have a division that our kids are ready for 21st century skills or they critically think, mm-mm. I, here's a homework assignment for everyone. Go to your state curriculum framework. Look through the skills that are mandatory to learn or, or knowledge that's mandatory to learn. And be objective and ask yourself, is that really critical thinking or is that really rote memorization? You're not going to yeah. find a whole lot of critical thinking anywhere. Yeah. But yet... This is what divisions push because that is what the state mandates and the federal government says. Yeah, yeah, so true. Well, this has been very interesting and I so much appreciate you um, sharing with us today. Um, just as we kind of wrap up, um, do you have any final thoughts for uh, those listening uh, could be to parents, could be to teachers, could be folk interested in running for school board, um, just on, on any particular level, just any final thoughts you want to share with our audience. Sure. So for parents and grandparents that raising, you know, uh, children, I, I would say that you... <laughs> We are living in, in, a, in a day and time to where you have, you know, decisions to make about education uh, with regards to with what's being pushed and what's coming down in public education. And that's not going away. And you have to make the difficult decision. Do I keep my children there and suffer the consequences or do I public or do I private school or do I homeschool? And those are not easy decisions, but you're going to have to make those. And it's not going to get any better on the public school side. Doesn't matter who you put in there, that elected official, um, until you start to chain out, uh, change out the fund, the foundation and the structure, it's not going to get any better. 
to uh, like-minded teachers. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, Mr. Adams, or not, um, uh, but many teachers are leaving, and it's not because yep. we're retiring, yep. and it's not because of the pay. Yep. Um, we're leaving because we can't participate in this, and many of those same teachers are going out, and they're starting their own micro schools, learning pods, their own schools, because they know what good quality instruction and the role of the parent is. To those teachers, um, I applaud you, keep your head up. And those of us that are still in um, the system, um, do the best you can, but know yourself and don't, you know, don't violate who you are, um, you know, with this. Those that are running for school boards across this nation, you need to ask yourself one question. <laughs> Why are you doing it? And if your answer comes back with something that sounds like a one minute sound bite, don't do it. <laughs> um, go deeper. Really know why you're doing this. You know, you can't say I'm doing it because it's for the kids or I'm doing it to get just books out of the classroom. And you know, those are reasons. Yes. But, you know, Understand and, 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 and if you can come up with something along the lines of I'm doing this because I want to fundamentally shift the direction of where we are going. Now you've got your why. And then you start to learn what does that fundamental shift look like? And you start to learn those three rings, how the federal and the state and the local are all tied together. And then you start looking at, well, how can we change this or can it be changed? Because you might find yourself actually going to the private or the homeschool option as well. So, Ted, that's awesome. And uh, let me just tag on to there, uh, particularly the last section. Um, we do have an online school board training uh, that can be found on our website, which is NWEF, like Noah Webster Educational Foundation, NWEF.org. And... Uh, that at least will help frame, give you a framework for some of the things that Ted talked about and uh, help you even determine whether or not it's right for you, uh, give you some talking points that uh, can help you if you choose to go forward. And uh, Ted, it's been very informative. Thank you for your time today. Uh, we agree in one thing. Um, we do have problems in this country with our education, but we agree too that if people will get involved and put the child first and be principles based, um, I believe that we can bring about change that will make things better. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about exclusively change within the public system, though I believe that can be done to greater and lesser extent state by state. We're seeing some things happening through legislation and through other means. We're seeing that happen because of parents and, and, and uh, community leaders that are getting involved and saying, look, we want to see fun fundamental changes. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, competition is the best thing we can have in our schools. It, it works in business. It works in every area. Uh, competition almost always makes the quality of the product go up and drives the cost down because competition always has the consumer in mind uh, and, and at the same time has to be viable and, and you know, profitable. And so the same principles can apply to education. And as we promote that and allow that and encourage that across this country, I believe we're going to see a lot of positive changes. So Ted, thank you again for joining us. And thank you to all of you who have tuned in for this session. Trust you have a great day.